Mao Mao literally takes center stage in episode 6 and 7 as she showcases her unparalleled love of poison as well as her ability to uncover the secrets hidden within the rear palace. Episode 6 unfolds during the grand party. Despite Mao Mao's efforts to provide warmth, the emperor, dowager, empress, and concubines present in the gathering steal the spotlight, leaving the ladies in waiting in the cold, both figuratively and literally. And while the festivities are taking place, there is all kinds of drama playing out behind the scenes. Mao Mao receives more hairpins, raising questions about Lady Liwa's intentions. Amidst disputes among rival ladies-in-waiting and gossip surrounding the senior concubines, Consort Li Shu becomes a focal point. During the banquet, Mao Mao and her fellow poison testers embark on a culinary adventure, if risking your life to ensure a dish is not poison can be called an adventure, that is. The stark contrast between Mao Mao's enthusiasm for tasting poison and the other testers' sheer terror is evident. However, at one point, Mao Mao does notice that there's tension in Consort Li Shu's expression when she eats the food that she served, hinting at potential trouble. Trouble does indeed find them all when Mao Mao discovers poison in the soup and after making the shocking announcement, withdraws from the scene. While the party descends into chaos, Mao Mao is beyond thrilled at having had a sweet, sweet taste of poison after so long. But Jin Shi, who finds her and is concerned for her well-being, drags her to the doctors for treatment. Switching back to work mode, Mao Mao unravels two distinct plots at play. The first is the unfortunate bullying of a concubine by her own attendants, and the second and far more sinister one is a poisoner targeting Li Xu, leaving questions about its resolution and the underlying motives for another episode. Tired of laying about in bed, recovering from her poison exposure, Mao Mao seeks a change in pace by embarking on a little bit of investigative work. Gaoshen, at Jinshi's request, delivers the infamous silver bowl containing the poison soup to Mao Mao. With a dash of forensic flair, she dusts the bowl for fingerprints, revealing an extra set of prints on the bowl's edge, hinting at an outsider's involvement in the poisoning plot. Decoding the clash of styles between Li Shu and Yokyo, coupled with the previous food swapping, Mao Mao exposes the extent of bullying that Li Shu faces from her own ladies in waiting. On top of that, it is now confirmed that there was definitely someone who tried to poison Li Shu. The ongoing threat of an assassin keeps Jinshi on edge, and as Gaoshen and Jinshi interact, a new facet of Jinshi's character, which contrasts with his public persona, is revealed. Together with the fact that Gaoshen and Jinshi's relationship goes way back to Jinshi's childhood. Amidst the palace intrigue, Mao Mao learns about the true significance of the gifted hairpins from Xiaolan. These trinkets aren't just accessories, they're a subtle way to ask for favors. Armed with this newfound knowledge, Mama approaches Li Haoku, the soldier who had bestowed a hairpin upon her during the party. Though initially dismissive, Li Haoku's resistance crumbles in the face of Mao Mao's enticing offer. A rendezvous with the three princesses, the elite courtesans at the renowned Verdigris house. Succumbing to curiosity and temptation, Li Haku agrees to be her escort, enabling Mao Mao to visit her father, who, by the way, views her employment in the rear palace as a twist of fate. Okay, you guys, I am so tired of these episodes being only 10 minutes long. I get so immersed in this story that before I know it, the ending credits are rolling and I am crying because I have to wait for another week for the next one. I guess this just means that we're being treated to some superior storytelling. And on top of that, when I compare these episodes to the source material, I'm struck by the realization that next to no content was cut out. And this makes my job just a little bit more challenging because as your one and only magpie, it is my sacred duty to find precious tidbits from the light novel that were left out. There were some little details that I found interesting. The anime hinted at this briefly, but Mao Mao is sincerely fond of Princess Lingli. The light novel states that Mao Mao is not fond of children in general, but Lingli seems to be a special case. In fact, everyone dotes on the princess. 
And while Mao Mao questions the wisdom in exposing Lingli to the chilly wind during the garden party, she admits that the princess being cute is really recent enough to do so. Moreover, compared to Lingli's earlier sickly and pale state, she now enjoys excellent health. With rosy cheeks and healthy plumpness, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Mao Mao looks at her with a sense of pride. After all, it was her intervention that played a crucial role in transforming Lingli from a sickly child into a lively and energetic one. Additionally, the fact that Mao Mao and her fellow ladies in waiting were doting on Princess Liwa when they actually should have paid their respects to the senior consort first was what had the virtuous consort pouting in displeasure. And speaking of rival consorts, while Liwa appeared to give Mao Mao a hair stick, Mao Mao quickly assessed her health, noting that she was a little plumper, though not yet back to her old self, and notes that perhaps Consort Liwa should be more warmly dressed. This instance with Liwa highlights Mao Mao's caring nature. Despite having left the Crystal Palace, Mao Mao remains attentive to her former charge's well-being. Unable to visit herself, she has had to rely on casual remarks from Jinshi for updates on Liwa. This underscores Mao Mao's generally warm-hearted character and genuine concern for others. Instead of dismissing Li Hua from her thoughts altogether, she has continued to watch over her old charge's health if even only from a distance, and suggests that maybe her fellow ladies-in-waiting might not be as delusional as Mao Mao assumes. She really is a good girl. However, that does not mean to say that she doesn't have a temper. When she proposed to administer a purgative to Consort Li Xu in front of Jinxi, it wasn't driven by altruism, but rather a desire to retaliate for Li Xu's earlier show of disdain. Offering to make Li Xu some laxatives to flush out her system was a subtle form of revenge, intending to embarrass Li Xu by suggesting such an indelicate and embarrassing treatment while Jinxi was present. The anime skipped the section in the light novel where Xiaolan grills Mao Mao about the events of the garden party, particularly about the poison soup. Rumors about the attempt are rampant in the rear palace, but Mao Mao, despite being the one who uncovered the poison, remains tight-lipped about her involvement and shares not a single detail about her role, much to Xiaolan's disappointment. Upon Mao Mao's visit to Verdigree House and her greeting, the old madam, the light novel reveals that the elderly woman was once a renowned courtesan. In her prime, she was famed as a lady with tears of pearl, who declined numerous offers seeking to buy her freedom. Instead, she chose to stay and oversee the esteemed establishment, becoming a legendary figure in the process. And speaking of Verdigree's house, the light novel emphasizes on Lihaku's motivation to visit the place. It wasn't solely his lust for female companionship that drove him there, but rather the prospect of simply meeting one of the courtesans was just an honor for him, even beyond the potential for more intimate activities. Indeed, the light novel underscores that the most talented courtesans didn't engage in the sale of their bodies. Instead, they showcased their beauty and talents for wealthy patrons, highlighting a more refined and artistic aspect to their interactions with them. Yet, the courtesans could still fall in love, and the old lady knew it. That's why she sent Lihaku with his fit body over to Pyrene, knowing that the courtesan would pounce on him and thus drive Mao Mao's debt even higher. Man, this old lady is ruthless. No wonder Mao Mao is left in a state, wondering who she can send to Verdigree's house to make up for this debt, and laments her unfortunate circumstances that have her with limited options. The nature of the rear palace, where only women and eunuchs live, poses a challenge. Even considering sending Jinshi is deemed problematic because she fears that his charismatic presence might not just disrupt the tranquility of the establishment, but actually bring Verdigree's house to its knees and end up in its ruin. The anime clears up the confusion surrounding the poison soup. 
Initially, this confusion arises as viewers and readers might question why they are so focused on investigating Concert Lee Shu and only Concert Lee Shu when it is mentioned that another person, a minister, also collapsed after tasting the soup. The anime clarifies that the minister's collapse wasn't due to his tasting his own soup. Instead, it shows one of the ministers getting up from their seat in the garden party and running towards Mao Mao's seat. While the direct act of him tasting the soup from her bowl isn't shown, the white shot showing many people crowding around her seat suggests that, disregarding Mao Mao's warning, he consumed the soup from her bowl. This stupid act leads to his subsequent poisoning and shows that Consul Li Shu was the specific target of the poisoning, and the minister's collapse was just a result of him being an idiot and, of course, tasting the soup from Mao Mao's bowl. This clarification resolves any confusion about the intended victim of the poisoning plot. And when talking about anime-only content, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the preciousness of Mama when she was a little girl running after her father. I did not expect for my heart to melt at seeing such preciousness. This anime-only scene not only explores the cute side of Mao Mao as a child, but also provides insights into the nature of her relationship with her father. His portrayal as a gentle and caring figure adds emotional depth to their connection, and we are left anticipating a potential backstory that could unravel the mystery surrounding both her and maybe her father's story. Because given that he trained Mao Mao, you know that he's beyond competent. So why is he living in less than ideal conditions by himself in the worst part of town? I guess we just have to wait for answers. These two episodes were a delightful showcase of Mao Mao's diverse expressions and moods, which continue to be my favorite parts of this anime, to be honest. From her fantasizing about tasting her favorite poisons, to looking sparklingly happy at having taken such excellent medicine, medicine that, you know, made her hurl into a bucket, to her terrifying expression when she warned Li Shu's food taster not to pull any more tricks on her lady. I love every single facet of her protagonist's expressions and moods, and I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have found her puking out sparkles after Granny Sponge as hilarious as I did, but oh my goodness, Mao Mao didn't seem to mind it. In fact, she found it nostalgic. What the heck? Also, I don't know if you caught it, but I love the little sound effects that Mao Mao made when gathering tools for the investigation and when Gaoshun is wrapping up the soup. The voice actors themselves make these little effects and they just sound really charming and I haven't seen any other anime do this. Now, the scattering of petals during the scene where Mao Mao presents her letters of introduction to convince Liaku to help her looks not just pretty but adds to the showmanship that she employs to tease him into accepting her requests and emphasizes the theatricality of Mao Mao's approach, showcasing her resourcefulness and ability to navigate the intricacies of palace life. Finally, witnessing Jinshi slogging through paperwork in anticipation for some free time, unaware that he will miss seeing Mao Mao for a few days, was undeniably amusing, and I really look forward to seeing his reaction to her return and can only wonder how much he will pout due to this unexpected absence. These two episodes offered a few more glimpses into both Mao Mao's and Jinshi's backgrounds. His hair stick, carved in the shape of a mythical sacred beast, singles him out as someone of considerably high rank. Additionally, given that he was conveniently missing during the garden party, and at the same time there was mention of the Emperor's sickly younger brother, and how that brother is also absent, it's an open invitation for us to speculate and wonder at the intriguing possibility that Jinshi might actually be the Emperor's younger brother. On the other hand, episode 7 delves into Mao Mao's personal history as she takes a temporary break from the rear palace. Her visit home not only reveals her genuine excitement to be back with her father, but also hints at a potential connection between Mao Mao and the palace that she might not be aware of. 
What I love about this series is how beautifully it integrates these little revelations into the overall narrative. So while we get a mystery of the week, we still know that there is an overarching mystery surrounding their identities that keeps us coming back for more and more. Thank goodness this is a 24 episode season because I cannot get enough. Lucky for me, these episodes are being dubbed as well. And honestly, they are incredibly well done. If you enjoy these videos, let me know via a like, a comment, or if you want to make me especially happy, visit my Ko-fi page and buy me a coffee to help me keep cranking out these videos. Until the next time, bye bye.